Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, Chris Tobin and I are talking to Brittany Williams. She's the Director of Operations and Engineering at Wisconsin Public Radio. They're making huge improvements. you got to hear about what they're doing next on Twerked. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by the CalRec Type R console system. Type R is a brand new, modular, expandable IP based radio system from CalRec Audio. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host, and <laughs> delighted to be here. It's a beautiful Thursday afternoon. I'm I'm here in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee, my uh, my home domicile, my office, and my studio, and it's just, it's just great to be here. I'm so excited about today's show. I know I say that about most of the shows, but I really am today. <laughs> um, what else is there? That's uh, well, We just got a good show ahead. We have a great guest, but first, before we introduce you to our great guest, uh, Chris Tobin is here. I know it's a little bit of a letdown, but he's here. Hey, Chris. <laughs> I didn't mean that's that. A, you know, I didn't mean just that. just how it goes, you know. It's, it's okay. <laughs> no, we're going to have a great show. It's going to be a good time. and have a good conversation lined up, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. And you know what, Chris? We're both in our cozy studios. It's chilly outside here in Nashville. Is it chilly there in, in New Jersey? Well, I'm not a very good barometer because I like it chilly. So I will say from what I've been told by others, yes, it is chilly. It's 44 degrees outside and it's chilly. Eh, For me, it's, it's about that. I'm enjoying yeah. it. You are. <laughs> it's about that here. Let's see. What is it here? Oh, oh, my goodness. No, we got a south wind bumped up to 61. We got rain on the way. So we've got a south wind ahead of that rain, bringing lots of that Gulf moisture up. That's what always happens here in Nashville. Hey, our show, uh, If if Chris or I were out on remote, that is away from normal internet wired access, we'd be using this, the Max Connect Wireless Box from MaxConnectWireless.com. And you know, this looks like an ordinary, uh, you know, or a good quality uh, modem uh, from Cradle Point, and it is. But what the key to this is, is the SIM card that's inside. This one actually has two SIM cards, one for Ryzen and one for AT&T, but they are no ordinary SIM cards, no and indeed. Uh, the SIM cards in here will get you access to a quality of data service that everybody around you doesn't have, unless they're a first responder. But everybody else around you will be fighting for data while you're there happily moving your data at you know whatever speed you pay for. We're getting five megabits per second up and down with our Max Connect. And so if you're out on remote and you need to do a live remote with audio or with video, check out Max Connect from a uh, bone broadcast, but you go to max connect wireless. I know it's spelled funny, but you know, you have to do that these days. Max connect wireless.com. <laughs> the link is in the show notes. You can look at it there on the screen and you get prioritized data. Now this is good for remotes. And I know I talk about that, but it's also good for a backup STL to your radio transmitter site. So if you lose your normal STL, 950 satellite, uh, whatever it may be, maybe it's, it's a ubiquity or, or some other kind or, Cambium, you know, uh, wireless 5.8 gig, uh, whatever it may be, this is a great backup for your STL, can keep you on the air. Absolutely. So check it out. Max Connect Wireless. Love these guys. Comes with uh, comes with antennas, you know, or you can connect up uh, external antennas. This thing does Wi-Fi, but I recommend if you're going to use it, you know, connect to the LAN connector on there and get yourself prioritized data, prioritized over everybody else. Everybody else is going, hey, how come my Facebook's kind of slow? And um, you're getting data. From Max Connect Wireless. All right, let's bring in our guest. Our guest. I'm so excited to have our guest on because she and yes, gentlemen, I said she is the director of operations and engineering at Wisconsin Public Radio. Oh my gosh, what a seemingly a <laughs> cherry job! <laughs> it's Brittany Williams. Hey, Brittany, welcome in. Hey, Kirk. Thanks for having me. It is delightful to have you on here, and I have just uh, been, I looked a little bit at your LinkedIn page and been a little amazed with your, uh, shall we say, oh, that's meteoric. that's very outdated. <laughs> oh, your, me your meteoric <laughs> rise uh, in, in position there at Wisconsin Public Radio. I, gu I guess you're a quick study. Oh, well, it has been 12 years. Um, oh. But yeah, uh, okay. I've been here. This is, uh, this is the only job I've ever had. I started as an intern when I was a freshman in college. Yeah. So yeah. 12 years on. And well, uh, you, yeah. 
you, you, you've got this enormous project. It's actually several projects all kind of wrapped into with one big timeline or so. And uh, you're managing this project. Give us a little taste of, of what you guys at Wisconsin Public Radio are doing. And then after our commercial break, we're, we're going to jump right into it and find out uh, some of the technicalities and some of the the, th the challenges that you've come against with this big up, these big upgrades. Sure. Uh, Wisconsin Public Radio is a uh, large statewide network. Uh, three of them, actually. We have a, a talk network, call-in shows that we call the Ideas Network, an NPR News and Classical Network, and then we run an HD2 network uh, that streams C24 uh, out of Minnesota Public Radio. Um, and they cover the whole state on 37 transmitters. And our flagship location, a studio location for the networks is in Madison, Wisconsin. And we have six other bureaus in addition to that around the state that have studios. Um, and so let's see, I think that totals 30 studios altogether. Um, and in March of 2018, we uh, decided we were going to just upgrade the Vilas Studios in Madison uh, with some Axia mm -hmm. consoles. And that's how it yeah. all began. <laughs> and it's certainly way more than that now. Oh, so the project scope has grown enormously. Significantly. All right. We're going to hear um, we, about it. And, uh, and you're going to tell this interesting story of how you wanted to put some equipment on a floor in your building and found out it was too heavy. For the building. Yes. Oh my gosh. That that's that's coming up. Chris, you're gonna love this story about how they figured out that they couldn't fill up racks full of um expensive computer gear and networking gear because the building wouldn't hold it. So and also I I know that they came I I got I got a quick tour of the place uh a, a few weeks ago and oh my god, the stories are just amazing. Hey, our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at Angry Audio. And we've got a we got something fun to do right now. We're gonna do an unboxing. You know, for uh, a few months we have been telling you uh about the guest gizmo. And this is a guest gizmo right here in this box. And by the way, if you're listening uh to the show only and you're not watching on video, I'm so sorry. Well, I'll describe this as best I can, but I'm going to let me tilt the camera down here and a suncast is going to keep me full screen here. We're going to open up the box and this is a guest gizmo. Now we talked about this on the air here for a long time. The guest gizmo is something that you can install in your studios and it gives you a beautiful look. Look at all this bubble wrap. Okay. So down in there is the guest gizmo and it looks like it comes wrapped in the, in the pink uh, static proof um, bag. Oh look! It's even got uh, it's even got one of these pouches that says "Do not eat." So that's that's not a salt pack. That's something you don't eat. Okay, put that aside. Okay, so here we have the guest gizmo. I'm showing it on the screen. It is a headphone amplifier, headphone amp, but it's also a logic interface uh, to those LED lights that uh, grace uh, some of the newer um, uh, mic arms these days, like the Mika mic arms. So you've got a you've got a cough switch here on the front. And that lights up when you're on the air and you've got a volume control that controls the headphone. And here's the, you know, it's, it, it's chock full of high quality electronics inside. I have seen the diagrams of how this stuff fits in there. And I know it's, it's a box and I know we can miniaturize electronics quite a bit these days, but this thing is so well designed. It's just amazing inside, uh, built to last, you know, as long as your control room, <laughs> maybe longer. And here's the cool thing. You, you want to make this look good going into your furniture, it's easy. You take a two and three quarter inch hole saw and you drill a round hole in your furniture and this thing fits perfectly in it. And the, uh, the, the overlap right here covers up the hole. And so you've got this, you don't have to buy a router. You don't have to be a super good carpenter. You just drill a round hole of the right size and whoop, this fits right in. You screw it down and it looks absolutely fantastic. Check out the guest gizmo from angry audio it comes of course with uh power supply oh yeah there's a picture of it right there in is mounted in the in the console comes with a little power supply uh comes with a thank you note hi thank you so much for your purchase we are grateful a user guide is available online please visit our site your friends at angryaudio.com and it does come with uh some screws that match to help you screw it right in hold it in place and uh, some cable ties, too, to kind of help things uh, hold together there. And and the, by the way, there are holes in the side of the cabinet here that hold this kind of cable tie with a little pin that goes in there to hold your cables and give them some support. All right, cool. Uh, that's one of the many products they have 
at Angry Audio that'll make your studio look a whole lot better. AngryAudio.com. Thanks a lot for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. They got Studio Hub, too. We'll look at the cables in a few minutes. All right. Kirk Harnack, Chris Tobin here. And Chris and Brittany are both in the public radio world. Uh, so uh, you two are going to have a fun time chatting about uh about life in in public radio um but Brittany, i'm not sure where you want to start you, you started already telling us you started with a, a small upgrade project and at some point you decided wait a minute we we, we, we got to do a lot more if we really want to join the modern age in radio broadcasting and give people the tools they need to make terrific content we, we got to do more so tell us a little bit about your journey well, uh, we just, like I said, started wanting to upgrade the studios. Uh, the We had a Wheatstone uh, D8000 in the two large uh, network studios and hadn't really been running since the early 90s. Um, and our workflows have changed and the furniture and the space and didn't match uh, the way we used the rooms anymore. Um, and of course, with the D8000, the furniture was cut out to accommodate it. So uh, with Axia consoles, we needed new furniture. And at that point, you might as well deal with the rooms since uh, studios are hard to give a paint job and, and a little sprucing when they're on air all the time. The other problem we always had in uh, Madison was uh, a lack of a sort of standard UP Yes, um, just we had the little consumer grade or prosumer grade in little units in the bottom of every rack and batteries and they died and they failed and we forgot about them. Um, we just had random mismatched EPSs all over. So we decided that since the Pathfinder appliance um, would replace our master switcher um, in our mm -hmm. what we call the ROC, uh, Radio Operations Center, it's our rack room. Um, the old Sierra video system uh, uh, matrix switcher was being replaced with Pathfinder. And uh, so we figured if we're going to take out the rack, we're going to dismantle everything. At this point, if we're going this far, we should at least get one big fancy UPS to power all the racks and the two main studios at the same time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we spec'd a 20 kVA uh, Liebert. We thought that was going to be great. It was going to give us everything we wanted. Um, the electricians thought it was a great idea, and our construction is being fisted by a group on the UW-Madison campus. Um, we're part of UW-Madison, and so they're doing it sort of in-house, and we have an architect and an interior designer and all these people. Um, and no one thought about this 20 kVA UPS until Alex, <laughs> Alex <sighs> Hartman. And um, his his uh, optimized media group with, with Jim Gray, um, we hired them to help us um, act as sort of extra hands uh, contract firm to help us. Alex suggested that there might be a weight issue with the UPS. Never even crossed my mind. So, so uh, uh, Brittany was talking about Alex Hartman, who's been on this show before, and uh, he uh, he lives in Wisconsin as well. And he was doing some consulting, and for some reason, he thought, hey, you know what, this this equipment's heavy. Uh, this Liebert UPS is going to be heavy. And by the way, Brittany said something um, pretty important, I think. And Chris, why don't you uh, tell me your thoughts on this? Brittany said that we had a lot of little UPS, and we tended to forget about the batteries in these things. I've done the same thing. You know, we got some APC or other brand, you know, rack mount UPSs, put a few of them at the bottom of some racks. And this is, uh, you know, I've been in perfectly big radio stations, good operations where this is done as opposed to a centralized UPS. And I forget about the batteries. Now, I know I should put a label on the front that says the date or in the date of when to check them and all that. But I've, I've, I've had issues forgetting about that. When you have a big honk and centralized UPS... I think you tend to think more about it. You you consider it an important part of your infrastructure, and you don't forget about it. Chris, what's been your experience along those lines? Well, um, basically, whenever I've worked on projects that involve the larger UPSs, as uh, Brittany's talking about, first thing I always inquire about and work with the architects is load uh, floor loading. Um, you have to do that in general. I mean, anytime you build any facility especially if it's in a new building, uh, the floor designs are such that the loading per square foot could be very small compared to what you're, you're, you're accustomed to. Say, for instance, you know, I worked wow. at a facility at a radio station years ago that it was a poured concrete building. It was built in the 30s. You know, the floor was probably three feet uh, in thickness, the whole bit. Floor loading was never an issue, even though we still did it. But you know, the architect came back 
I can the floor loading is 300 pounds per inch or something. It was like something we did because the building in, the, in its high heyday was actually used greenery. So you didn't think about it. Fast forward to today, and many buildings, uh, the floor structure is such that it's like a corrugated steel with concrete across the top. So the floor loading is a little different with trusses beneath. So you got to be prepared for that. And uh, a lot of times we forget, we overlook that. And yes, small UPS is the battery weights, a couple of pounds here and there. A large 20 kilo, kilovolt, uh, kilowatt UPS is probably several thousand pounds. So yeah, you got to, <laughs> you got to think about these things. And I can <laughs> tell you working in old building, uh, you know, the City Corp and uh, say Empire State Building and a few others here in town, floor loading comes up as the second question, how much do you have to pay for the, the space? So uh, yeah, yeah, you definitely want to check on that. Let's see if, if, if Brittany uh, got back uh, with any quality here or not. We might have a problem with at the network. Oh, Brittany, you look, look fine. So uh, how's your connection? Seems good? Uh, seems good? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, see, it seems, seems good on, on this end. So take, take us on to the next, uh, after the floor loading thing. When I visited you guys, I, you guys had everything torn apart. The walls were all torn apart. There was wire hanging down from the ceilings. It looked like a, a disaster zone, but of course, that's what construction looks like or reconstruction. Um, what? what get, t tell us a little, a little bit of the, of the pain. What else did you find in the building without naming names that you said, oh my gosh, it's a good <laughs> thing we tore this wall out. We got to correct this. Yeah. What'd you find? Uh, well, after we realized that we couldn't put this equipment that we wanted inside the building as is, and I'm glad Chris thought of thinks of floor loading often, but that was my first time. Now I know better. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so we had to find a new home. We moved our central operation two blocks off site from the studios into a, a data center on campus uh, to accommodate mm -hmm. what we wanted. And um, that's when the project really started snowballing. But back to just the normal construction in the studios, it shouldn't have been uh, terribly complicated. We needed new flooring and uh, paint and some ceiling tiles, new lighting. Um, and I did want to move a door. There was a door in <laughs> a location that I thought was inconvenient. And we uh, live in a 1970s uh, concrete brutalistic architecture building. And I thought, you know, if we're doing this, we might as well do it correctly. Let's move the door and make everyone happy. Um, well, they started demolishing and uh, they expected to find some lintels in the wall to uh, attach the new door frame to. And once yeah. the Masons got in here and Jack hammered everything, those weren't there uh, where they expected them to be. So that brought another structural engineer in to figure out how to solve that problem. And, uh, we had a drop ceiling in the studios. It was just very old and dated. Um, we knew there was a second original ceiling above it that would have to be demolished. Um, but then they started going at it and then they found a third ceiling above that oh. one. Um, so just oh, this building, it hides secrets uh, from, <laughs> from the 70s. And then the worst part that caused the, the six month delays that we're really feeling now um, was, when the electrician um, decided that he wanted to take a peek behind the breaker panel uh, that's on the generator for the building, and that's what he was going to hardwire our newly downsized 10 kVA <laughs> UPS, um, yeah. still just for a couple wrecks we have to keep on site. Uh, he's going to hardwire it into the, into the panel, so we had to take the cover off. He looked inside of it, and uh, his heart sank. Um, he, to him, it looked entirely homemade. Um, he what? it looked like this the circuits were just sitting in between the steel support beams in the wall um so the masons come back they demolish the back side of the wall to see what's going on uh, behind the breaker panel turns out it was in an uh, a bucket an electrical bucket as it should have been but you couldn't see it because the entire thing uh was encased in what the electrician decided to call lead paper um no one knows what it was what it was for it was wrapped around the entire box and about four feet into the wall on all sides and of course it's lead so it has to be abated um uh, all of this yeah. led to us rewiring all the electrical in the entire studio loop um that we're we're tackling and this construction project entails 11 studios in madison so all new electrical, new conduits run, everything uh, redone. Good thing is it's correct now um, and it's very <laughs> nice and accessible and labeled, um, but it's taken significantly longer than we ever anticipated. So, so 
uh, I got to see your performance space. That's one of your 11 studios, right? The performance space? Yes. Yeah. And it was a wreck when I saw it, but you were still producing some <laughs> programs in there. How, and so I, I remember you telling me that you like mentally prepared some of the hosts and guests to, to do their show in the totally jacked up space. How did you, yep. I mean, you're pretty good dealing with people. How did you do that? Uh, yeah, we, well, in order to, uh, remodel the main network studios, uh, were still alive every day for 11 hours a day. They had to, they had to go somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. so I moved our talk network, the ideas network into that large performance space. It's called Buck studio. Uh, they have a lot of bodies and people involved in their show. They needed more space. So we took some old desks, uh, from people's offices that were being moved and thrown out and sort of cobbled together a makeshift studio in the middle of the floor. But Buck Studio also is our largest gathering area and the only storage we have available. So if you can imagine these hosts sitting around old desks that are just sort of mismatched together, um, surrounded by boxes and boxes of unopened Axia gear awaiting the construction <laughs> to be finished, to be installed. And uh, as we demolished, we, you know, we mm. dismantled the studios in preparation for construction. All of that equipment that we wanted to keep got piled in there. When the furniture got delivered, that got piled in there. So they just grew and grew around the hosts. Um, and our other network, they, they're largely a, a solo single host operation. So they got stuck in a very tiny, tiny little prod room with no windows. Oh, um, yes. I met the I, lady who was uh, on the air at the time. Yeah. And I, is this, yeah. is this, uh, is this, uh, um, depressing to be in here? And she said, yeah, a little bit. I'd like a window. Yeah. They're all really good sports about it though. Um, and in order to make the temporary studios, we used, uh, the Axie equipment, um, so the Ideas Network has a fusion that's supposed to be flush mount, but it's just sitting tabletop on those old desks in Buck. And I put an IQ in for the, the music network. And the new consoles helped uh, ease the pain quite a bit. They were all really happy to, uh, to use them, and they thoroughly enjoyed that part. Everyone misses the windows and um, quiet, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, but, you know, they've been good sports. They know it's for it's for the long run. It's for the, it's for the greater good. <laughs> now coming up in the second half of, uh, of this show, uh, Brittany's going to uh, talk to us a little bit, a little bit about, uh, the network that goes across Wisconsin because they have other bureaus that she, she said, um, uh, they have transmitter sites, uh, also, but they also have some bureaus that are, are, you know, staffed with people and their news contributors and other program contributors. You know, Brittany, uh, um, uh, we're trying to imagine, you know, what I, I got to go there, but, um, uh, one of your shows is at least one, uh, I recognize right away is nationally known. And that's the, uh, is it Zorba pastor? Yep. Zorba uh, pastor on your health is one of the national mm -hmm. shows. The other one that we make is to the best of our knowledge. Oh, Actually, yeah, I'm sitting yeah. in front of a new, uh, this bookshelf is part of the renovation. Um, and it is uh, going to be the backdrop for videos that, to the best of our knowledge, we'll record with guests when they're in studio. Um, so this was a request of that show specifically, but I'm sitting in front of it first. No, no, wait. Those are all real books. It's real bookshelf. It's not a not oh, a yeah. wallpaper. Those are real books, and they came out of the host's office um, because those are books of authors they've interviewed. Oh my goodness, what a great idea! But I, I was just thinking, what a great idea to make wallpaper that looks like bookshelves make you look smart, you know, when really you don't read <laughs> much. Say, you and Chris, uh, why don't you compare notes on your performance studios? I've been to Chris's performance studio. Oh, by the way, uh, Brittany, you've mentioned a couple times the Buck Studio. You know what that is. What, what does that mean, the Buck Studio? Um, it's named after Philo M. Buck. Um, I actually don't really know who that is, but it's called Buck Studio. It's the large, okay. uh, giant performance space. Um, it's where we have a grand piano. Um, we have live musicians, largely classical, perform in there. There's a stage, um, and it's a meeting space for all staff. Um, it's sort of the all-purpose versatile room. But because of the grand piano and the performance space, um, it also has the nicest audio toys in it. Um, I think the largest group I've ever recorded in there was a choir of uh, 72 people. Ah, 
Well, I, I, and I took a second just to uh, look him up. Philo uh, Melvin Buck Jr. Uh, passed away in 1950 <laughs> in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, but uh, anyway, he was an author, an author. So okay, cool. And that and and there you go. You got a whole, a whole lot of books. Chris, um, um, now, well, let me ask uh, Brittany. Your your performance studios is, is it all put together yet, or is it still got um, got work? To do? Oh no, it's. It's still acting as the temporary ideas network studio and it's still very much gotcha. storage. <laughs> gotcha. Well, Chris, would you share a, a couple of your thoughts on uh, what you have found to be uh key to your performance studio? Uh, you, you're dealing with an old facility there, Chris, but you're making the best uh, of an older s situation. What, what uh, stands out in your mind that makes your performance studio uh, usable and sound good? Well, uh, first of all, anyone who has a performance space in their facility, whether it's old or new, try to uh, not use it as a storage facility. Okay, that's the first thing. Second, keep the floor space open so that you can, uh, on the fly, if you will, uh, move things around and produce a, you know, put together an event. In the case of our facility, which we're a music station, we tend to bring the back line of drums and bass guitar amps and uh, sometimes the Hammond organ out. And also uh, we have a couple of electronic keyboards. So keeping the floor space open and away from boxes that people take out of their office because they said, hey, I got no room. I'm going to put these things in this empty space. It's not empty. It's in use. Second thing is our facility, as yes, we've been here about 40 years now this year, and uh, the best thing you can do is make sure you have wall treatment. Make sure the wall treatment is, is acoustically designed to uh, reflect, I mean, absorb, I should say, not reflect, and then the ceiling in the same way. So this way, when you're outfitting your facility for, say, if you're doing spoken word, you know, talk show, sometimes we done, we have interviews in there, no music, and it's very nice and quiet. It's not totally dead, so your, your brain doesn't get panicky and think there's something wrong. Your equilibrium stays intact. But it's just the right room tone so that you can record and get something that works and then when it comes to music it's the same thing but the you know performance spaces are meant to be open when you're not using them they're not meant to be a storage area and i i say this very i i've been in many facilities recently where they have performance spaces i walk in and i say oh when do you have your next performance you know well nothing scheduled at the moment and you look around and there are these paper boxes and chairs and sometimes folding tables laying around i'm like do you guys use this as props? No, no. Somebody was clearing out an office, and I guess they thought this was a good place to put things. Yeah. Very yeah. bad idea. It creates a very <laughs> bad habit, and before you know it, you suddenly find yourself panicking when it comes time to use the room, and now what do we do? We also you're, host you're, members you're, in our facility, so we have an audience that comes in. It's not really good to have oh, yeah. folding tables and chairs laying around. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, now Brittany has got a situation there. Brittany, you know this is your situation is temporary, right? Because you got a lot of stuff in that room right now. Yes, we do. And uh, even though it's temporary, our problems um, in general, it is it's it is a bad habit amongst all staff to put uh, to use Buck as a storage space. Um, I let's see. Last year we did a massive clean out because uh, the. The ceilings are very tall and they're covered in thick velvet curtains um, and behind those curtains are shelves. Um, those are kind of allowed to be packed full of, of stuff, uh, but we did mm. a massive clean out and I think we sent away an entire U-Haul truck uh, full of stuff just to get out of the building and there's more to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, a few uh, weeks ago, I guess uh, a day or two, maybe the day I visited you guys, uh, you had some some of these um, uh, uh, wheelbarrow dumpster bins in the hallway. They're called tilt and carts. You were tilt carts. Thank you. Um, you had some tilt carts that were just chock a block full of analog wiring. Talk to mm -hmm. me and Chris for a minute. Then you're you're preaching the, to the choir here, but uh, talk to us about your transition from traditional wiring to audio over IP technology. What's that been like for you? Um, it's been hard and difficult and long and slow, um, but we, like many places, had an entire wall of 66 blocks with wiring that ranged from being original to 1970 when the building opened to the various decades since um, depending on what was needed it ran through conduits that were not documented so we don't know where they all go we've done our best to trace them out um, they added other conduits maybe in the 80s or 90s because they couldn't fill or the the originals were were full or we couldn't find where they were going 
um, all of this wiring and the 66 block wall has to come out. Um, and it's mm. nearly gone at this point. Um, with the Axia install, we didn't need it anymore at all. And I actually set a rule um, that with all of our new designs, I don't want to see a single 66 block in the entire plant. Not at all. Uh, <laughs> not allowed. Um, and we had a all new Cat6 cable run um, on newly installed cable trays that are labeled and plenum <laughs> fire coated. Um, yeah. Everything that yeah. we needed, we we find them. We have a map of where they where it goes. Um, that was a big deal because over the years, a lot of our analog equipment and these wires they weren't documented or they were installed randomly in a rush and then what was supposed to be temporary became forever people move on retire and no one knew what was going on um there are so many things that we found that we didn't know how they worked at all didn't know that they were still in service after 20 years of thinking it was shut down um just every every rack you dug into there were surprises um and part of this project with our move to the the data center um since our floor couldn't hold that that ups that we wanted uh has been to completely dismantle all of it and rebuild it from scratch uh documented and labeled this time did you have any gotcha moments where you were unhooked something that you were sure wasn't holding you on the air and all of a sudden somebody says Hey, we went off the air about five minutes ago. What'd you do? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, a no! number of times. A number of times. I, I can't say this entire process has been uh, clean and pretty for the listeners, um, especially after the cutover from when we went live from the data center with the air chain instead of um, from Vilas Hall. Uh, that week afterwards, oh, that was messy. <laughs> Those poor listeners. Um, but there were moments where uh, there was a, a patch cable plugged in uh, to some analog equipment, sort of bridging the digital and analog worlds for a moment while we got things together. That that patch bay was ancient. Um, and so uh, a headphone cord, like the Sony's, the, the curly one, was accidentally mm -hmm. wrapped around the cat the patched cable and it turned out to be holding everything on air so don't touch oh. the headphones just leave them there <laughs> until we're done <laughs> um <laughs> things like that happened a lot um one of the cool things that we designed in this in the new world um is a lab for us to play with uh we never had one before we didn't have a way to test out configs or uh listen through uh processors to try anything it was all done live on air and it was messy um that won't happen again <laughs> i say that now but <laughs> hey we are talking to Brittany williams she's the director of operations and engineering at wisconsin public radio in madison wisconsin and i got to visit there a few weeks ago uh with the wisconsin broadcasters uh, convention the clinic that was going on and see some of what they're doing and and uh we're going to talk about some of the infrastructure uh that is going on in a different building that was pretty cool. And also uh, what's going to be happening at their uh, at, at their bureaus uh, around the state. That's pretty interesting as well as they move from the world of really old analog and some a lot of surprises uh, into the world of audio over IP. I'm Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tobin. Our show This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcasters General Store. We'll be right back. <laughs> Yo, what's up? Live from NAB 2018. Hey, it's Caden. Uh, you need to check out Wheatstone and Box Pro 7.1. The upgrades are amazing. If you're a jock, if you're a talent, producer, whatever, a, a morning show, everyone knows Vox Pro, everyone uses Vox Pro, everyone loves Vox Pro. But now the features for this year, 2018, on 7.1 are amazing. If you're using, uh, using version 4.5.6 and you go to 7, this is exactly what you're missing right here. The features are a game changer. It's going to cut down your editing time by like 80%, depending on what you use Vox Pro for. And with uh, version 7.1, introducing unlimited practic button bars right here, hotkeys right here. I'm going to show you coming out of a song. Bad things. It's a lot of bad things that they wish and wish and wish and wish. So you're coming out of your song? Yeah. Start your next song right here. It's basically an entire production room right on Vox Pro. So it's the Vox Pro we know and love with a ton more features. And now uh, this is the ultimate game changer right here, effect macros. So instead of hitting your effects button bar and going up here using your mouse for every effect, you do it right here with one click of the mouse. 
and you're going to cut down your editing time by about 80% without even touching this new sexy black controller. Check it out right here, Wheatstone Vox Pro 7.1 at NAB in Vegas 2018. And you can get your Vox Pro from Broadcaster's General Store. They bring you not only uh, uh, those products, but a whole myriad of others. Any Anything you need for broadcasting, you, you call them at Broadcaster General Store. I got the number memorized. It's on the screen, too, at 352-622-7700. And, of course, their website is bgs.cc. BGS.cc for Broadcasters General Store. Awesome people, awesome service. And, yes, they have sharp pencils there, too. They can get your price really good at Broadcaster General Store. Thanks a lot. All right. Uh, it's Kirk Harnack and Chris Tobin. We're talking to Brittany Williams. Uh, she's the Director of Engineering and Operations at uh, Wisconsin Public Radio. So, Brittany, you've been filling us in on uh, on your move. And um, I must say the the bookshelf behind you is the best looking thing uh, that I've seen there. Because so I, I walked through there and the place was just, it looked like a bomb had gone off everywhere. Because you guys had to tear out walls, uh, do lots of new conduit, like you said. Um, Talk to me a little bit about, because uh, we're going to get into the, the network across the state and, and what we saw in your data center, which is pretty cool. But one of your strong points appears to be coordinating teams of people. Uh, you don't get down in the weeds on every technical aspect around there, but you do coordinate teams of people, get them to work together and get people to be happy about, you know, working in a tough environment for a, a, a short while. Tell me about, about those skills you, you seem to have. I think that... Uh... I think that it partially comes from the fact that I've been here for so long and I started, like I said, as an intern and I had a really, uh, really wonderful internship that was, I was required to work with every department uh, at least for a little bit while I was in school. And I happened to take a liking to uh, engineering. So I, once I made my first round, I sort of hung out with them uh, a lot more, but I've been around so long. Um, I think people have, have, grown to trust me. Um, and I care a lot about what we do. Um, and I care about the people and how it feels for them to work in this environment. So, um, I guess they, they believe me, which makes things easier. And then when it comes to my engineers, um, you know, this has been a difficult project and more than once, you know, we, we pulled 20 hour days repeatedly, uh, to, to get through something, um, had to do some really horrible jobs of pulling cable through this awful ceiling, just anything you can imagine. Um, the stress levels were definitely high, but I try to never ask my team to do something that I wouldn't do myself. And if, if they're going to, pull a 20 hour shift because they have something very specific to do when it comes to configuring Cisco switches or whatever, I'll be here right, right next to him. Uh, I don't know how to help, but I buy pizza and, you know, just try to keep them going. <laughs> but when there, when there is something that I can do, I, I don't know how many hours I spent crimping SL modular jacks at the data center. Um, it's a tedious job, but it had to be done. Uh, show me how to do it and I'll do it. Um, so, I, I just I'm in it with them at all times and I care about them. Uh, I try to feed them and give them beer, which helps too. So, <laughs> well, it's Wisconsin. Of course, that's beer and cheese yes. and cheese curds. <laughs> um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, what was about uh, designing studios. So you, so you said you moved a door. That was one thing, but in, in every studio you have worked to make sure that the working environment was going to be comfortable for the talent that gives them the best opportunity to make the best content that they can. Uh, talk to me, mm -hmm. uh, and me, me and Chris, a little bit about your philosophy on on comfort in a studio. Well, um, we have a lot of hosts here. Uh, I, I think I mentioned earlier that we are live 11 hours a day um, with local content. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot of hosts, a lot of action going on. They all have things that they need. Their shows are different. Um, they run differently. And... Um, when I was an intern, one of the, one of the tasks I did, I was a board op. I sat behind the console. I knew what it felt like to be in these rooms, um, and I I knew how uncomfortable they were. Uh, so, and I'd never seen what I would call a, a perfect studio um, where lines of sight are are clean. Um, you've got all the papers you need to hold, or the or the iPad holders, the console, everything's in reach. I'd, I'd never seen something I would call perfect. Um, so I aspired to do that with this, but I'm not the one who has to work behind those tables. So mm -hmm. I went to our, uh, 
it's sort of a junk shop on on campus where where you can go and buy used furniture or whatever. It's like the the campus Goodwill. Um, I bought a big giant wooden table for ten dollars. I brought it back to uh, our large performance studio, and I drilled a bunch of holes in it. Got uh, Mika Arms on demo, and uh, decided that we were going to play pretend studio for a while. Um, and I made mm. every single host sit behind this table. Um, we did everything from raise it to see what the height was that would be most comfortable for everybody, given that some hosts like to sit, some like to stand. We wanted to be ADA compliant. We didn't want to have moving furniture. How do we split the difference and get the best of all the worlds? So it was height to uh, length of mic arm, where it was placed on the table in relation to monitors, um, what chair would suit the situation best. We, I did all of that with the hosts uh, before we bought anything or made any final decisions on the furniture. Um, I also, even though it took longer, every time we had a, a furniture design, I had, you know, blueprints. Um, I would run around and ask everybody what they thought. <laughs> um, we went through a couple iterations, especially in that music studio, um, because there's also room for performers in there. So just anything and everything you could think of, but I involved the hosts and the producers and the, the managers the entire time, um, which took a lot of effort and we couldn't make everyone completely happy, but I think we've, the product we're going to end up with is the best possible thing that could have happened in this building. Um, so I'm really proud of that. Talk, talk to me and Chris a little bit about what um, full-time network products that you guys put out from Madison because you you in many towns you have more than one transmitter or you have an HD2 signal what's that that look like in that landscape there Sure so um that that ideas network the talk network that we we have um starting at 6 a.m. every day and going until 5 p.m. we have live call in shows um the morning show uh and then Larry Mueller is in the middle of the day, we have chapter day um, in central time. Those are all locally made in Madison and they're distributed statewide. Um, and then on the news, NPR News and Classical Network, starting at 5 a.m., we do morning edition that's uh, live hosted or locally hosted by reporters here. Um, in the middle of the day, it's all classical music that is local hosted from Madison distributed statewide and then we end with all things considered um the weekends also have live musical hosts uh and that's not just classical there's folk and and world music um jazz and uh those all originate and they go out over these these two networks that third network the hd the hd2 network um is like i said just a um a stream of classical 24 so it's all classical all the time um mm. and then that we don't we simulcast during the day with ourselves when we're live with classical music, but it's meant to be no news, just classical music all the time. Um, and then those bureaus you're talking about, the regions, um, yeah. the state, we have it sort of divided up into uh, seven regions, with Madison being one of them. Those other regions also produce local shows. They don't go out over network, but they go out for their region. Um and they're they're usually a news and public affairs related to local uh, local culture um, issues news whatever um, pertains to those areas more specifically, um, and then we have a team of reporters uh, distributed throughout the state at these bureaus um, based there, but they file statewide news um, all over the place all day long. Wow. So okay. So some of your distribution stays within the region that it was uh, intended for content wise, others are mm -hmm. statewide. And then of course you probably do you play some programming from NPR or other uh, national organizations. Yes, we do. Um, we, we take, you know, one a and uh, science Friday live off a of mm. satellite. Um, and then other, most other ones are uh, file based from um, FTP, like, like one a we air on the ideas network. Um, but all things considered uh, BBC and, uh, on um, morning edition are all done um, live off a of satellite. So, you know, when I was in public radio, our morning edition came in by a telephone line. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I was I was there when we switched from from equalized sort of equalized phone lines to satellite, and oh my goodness, mm -hmm. Bob Edwards sounded completely different. Uh, <laughs> oh, that, that's a, you're too young to know Bob Edwards, aren't you? 
That's I know the died. name. Oh, I know you? the yeah. name. <laughs> Chris, Chris, you remember Bob Edwards, don't you? Had that incredible voice. Absolutely. And I remember equalized lines and all those yeah. circuits that used to come in uh, non-satellite delivered. Yes, absolutely. I oh, still wow. have equalized lines uh, as a, a telco backup STL to a transmitter in Madison. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. they're they're in the wrong closet. I want them moved to a different room. And that is shockingly difficult. <laughs> oh, Wow. Um, no one will touch them. Uh, so in, in, I, I got to believe that your previous distribution network m m may have been a, a little wonky or hard to deal with, but you're, you're moving over to a totally IP based system. And at least what I understood was um, at the, the actual interconnect, the fiber and the, the muxing, cause you, you're getting a, you know, you're sharing um, fiber bandwidth with other state functions, right. Of the state of Wisconsin. But you've got you got IT guys who are expert and making sure your data gets through from point A to point B and point C and point X and Y and Z uh, like it's supposed to. At least this is what Alex Hartman led me to believe that, man, that's out of our <laughs> hands. And thank goodness that it is because these guys know what they're doing. Have, have I got that about right? Uh, kind of right. Um, we okay. have a, a partner organization that is a state agency called the Educational Communications Board. They are. Um, their job is distribution. They take care of Wisconsin Public Radio and now PBS Wisconsin, which was public television. And their mm -hmm. job is to distribute and take care of the transmitter sites. Me and my team um, at WPR don't go to transmitter sites. Um, they run a, or they maintain a statewide network uh, of fiber called BadgerNet. And that's mm. what our main uh, distribution and STLs run on. Um, Simultaneously, now that we are a part of UW Madison, UW System has its own fiber network across the state called CISNET. And we are um, in the middle of building out uh, our equipment to take advantage of CISNET um, as a, a redundant alternate path across the state to all the bureaus uh, for production. So we're trying to split these two networks into distribution and production and make them auto fail over for each other because, of course, there are outages. Um, so there, I, I have experts and uh, the ECB certainly has experts and um, their job as broadcast engineers is really networking. So, okay. So your staff doesn't take care of the transmitter sites. Is, is it, you said mm -hmm. it's ECB that does that? Yes. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Now, um, uh, one thing I want to touch on is your plans for backup in case something terrible happens in Madison, uh, because you've, you've got your studio location, you've got the data center, which is in a different building. And oh my goodness, uh, uh, we had to, we all had to, you know, biometrically sign into that place because there's some valuable assets in there. I saw them. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, let's just say they have no problem watching Netflix in that building. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and, but you've got a whole backup plan that will be implemented for your servers and your system in case something happens in Madison, you can still have the entire state network uh, on the air. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, if not details, at least some planning and thoughts about backup. Sure. Um, so when we moved into the data center, uh, it, it was purely a matter of weight in that floor. We didn't yet know that we were going to, that CISNET existed, that that UW system fiber network, that, that existed, that we were going to connect our bureaus that way. We didn't know any of this. This is all just sort of happened. Um, we reacted to things. Um, and so... It's a, it's a giant resource that we get to make use of, and we decided um, we decided that along with remodeling studios, maybe we should just change everything. Um, let's redesign the entire statewide network backbone on this fiber. Let's centralize all audio playout on virtual machines back in that data center in Madison. And anytime a bureau goes live, let's backhaul the audio to Madison and make every single STL um, originate from that data center. All it was a great idea. We're working on it. Um, it's it's going well. But what happens to the data center when something goes down? Um, we have our bureau in La Crosse, and uh, they also have a data center on campus. Uh, very nice one. Wonderful staff there. Um, we are duplicating everything we've done in Madison in sort of a miniature form in La Crosse, um, and. Lacrosse and Madison get the most redundancy, the most backup. 
um because it that's the file storage it's everything everything comes out of there the stls come out of there um we're duplicating those efforts in lacrosse so should anything ever happen to madison then uh within minutes or probably even less than a minutes we could switch over entire operations go live from lacrosse and buy us time to all drive there um and honestly, we chose lacrosse because because it's not centrally located in the state, um, but they have the other NPR downlink. They have satellite dish. So, ah, OK. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, one of the things that impressed me about uh, you and, and your staff was the frugality that you guys exhibit. Uh, so if you could buy a piece of equipment, either from another state agency, something that was a cast off or it had run its course uh, with some state agency, or even getting something from eBay, you guys are willing to do that as long as it was high quality gear that you understood and and, and know that you can service. Uh, I, I think that's, that's pretty cool that you guys are, are, you know, really care about the, the funds that you have to spend. Yeah. And, um, I mean, we are very specific about what we will buy used, um, but it has certainly meant, been a major part of this project. Um, one example was we had a we had a plan to to run with the connection between Livewire and uh, the studios in the Vilas building and the data center, and I don't know exactly what happened, but something went wrong with Cisco and and one very very cold polar vortex night. Um, Alex Hartman and crew were here and, and my own Eric and it was about 8 p.m. and the whole city was shut down. The campus was closed because of the polar vortex and they said, nope, this isn't going to work. We need to do something else. Um, so they decided that uh, we needed to buy some Cisco Nexus switches on eBay uh, because we'd already spent all of our funds and there was no mm. more budget left to make major changes, but this has to work. Um, so we, we bought Cisco's Nexus switches on eBay and they've been great. They've been fantastic. Um, and then there's other things where, uh, you know, I, I insisted that we buy new, um, yeah. uh, you know, it just, it just depends on what it is, but, um, we are thoughtful and careful for sure. Another cool thing that happened with the data center, um, the the campus IT group is called Do It uh, Department of Information Technology. Um, that's the data center we live in. They they need new fancy gear all the time for uh, servers for departments on campus. Whatever they're doing, their cast offs mm -hmm. um, looked wonderful to us because uh, they were too old for Do It, but they were newer than anything we had. Um, and so they were just gonna they were gonna junk them, um, and we just did an interdepartmental transfer, and now we have a test lab as well as emergency backups. So sometimes I think uh, these IT guys with budgets, they're like the person that owns a Bentley and gets a flat tire. Oh, lovely. Let's get a new Bentley. This one's got a flat tire. That's what it <laughs> seems to me. I could be wrong. Chris, uh, you didn't have the benefit of meeting Brittany and her teams uh, in Madison. What, what questions uh, might you have for Brittany before we have to go? Um, Wow, I mean, she covered all the stuff that I would be uh, expecting, I'm trying to think yeah. of what I could ask. Well, you know, I, one thing I'm curious about, you know, with a project like that, I've been involved in several. How how did you manage the uh, craft services for the teams as they were working, and how did you Ooh, manage the yeah. hours? And, and um, you know, just overall, the, it's human nature. You, you go 12 hours straight, and all of a sudden you start making mistakes. You, some people, you go six hours straight, and they become totally loopy. But um, yeah, I'm just <laughs> curious. No, I'm serious. I mean, I've worked on outdoor broadcasting. Yeah, you're right. I was doing work in Washington. You know, I did you know broadcast in Washington, covering political events and and just, you know, just the museum stuff. And it was fascinating. By you know four hours in, five hours in, people started making mistakes as well. It was oh yeah, that's right. It's twenty degrees outside temperature wise Fahrenheit. And then other days it was ninety five degrees Fahrenheit in the summer months. So I was just curious. I know two projects I worked on where we built multiple studios and multiple floors in a building that was totally uh, empty. It, it got a little wacky at times with folks working with no light, uh, no sunlight, which is, uh, what do you call it, um, work lights and a lot of noise. And uh, eventually people started mm -hmm. making mistakes. And I had to come up with ways to just, okay, you know what? Let's take a break. Let's do this. Let's try something different. Spalding balls was uh, flying around. People started wondering, what the hell's going on? I was like, trying to break the monotony. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Got you thinking, didn't it? Yeah, I am. By the end of some of these really long marathon sessions, I got to say that 
I, I know my crew pretty well now. Um, so I can tell when they're uh, they're hungry and they need to be fed. I can tell when they need a break. I can tell when we're just done for the night and that's the end of it. Um, so I'm not so good at doing that for myself, um, which was kind of helpful when uh, Optimize Media Group was around to say, all right, <laughs> it's it's bedtime. Um, but we certainly did. We, we had moments where we started making mistakes and... Uh, and we just had to call it some of the some of the nights though there were no options we made mistakes and had to keep going and and redo until you know to stay on air um especially on on cut overnight um there have been a lot of hours uh and i you know i i give my team flex time i you know take off go home i've, I've sent people home um or just said you know you've have you haven't taken a week's vacation since i can remember so pick one, you're going, that's the end of that. Um, and you know, it's hard though. It's really hard. Um, I never thought about throwing tennis balls around, but that's probably a good idea. <laughs> and ahead, on Mom. that, uh, on that, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking to Brittany Williams. She's the director of operations and engineering at Wisconsin public radio in Madison, Wisconsin. Chris Tobin is, is here. He's over at, uh, I guess you're at WBGO in, in Newark and I'm here in the Telos yes, Alliance yes. studio in, Na in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we're going to hear from our friends at, uh, at CalREC and we'll be right back. Hang on. CalREC's Type R is a modular, expandable, IP-based radio system featuring three slimline panels, a fader panel, a large soft panel, and a small soft panel easily configured to give the operator full control. Layouts are saved and recalled quickly between shows. A single 2RU core with integrated I.O. gets customers up and running fast, and that single core can power up to three independent mixing environments with no sharing of DSP resources. Available in four DSP packs and as your station grows larger packs can be added enabling it to grow with you power to the surface is supplied via standard poe switches keeping cabling to a minimum type r is fully aes 67 compatible as defined by simpty 2110 which means that it is also compliant with nmos discovery and connection management specs all these features combined make type r the most flexible radio console you can buy find out more at calrec.com slash twerk Thanks to CalRec for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Appreciate that. Hey, uh, our uh, Angry Audio uh, is where you can now get your Studio Hub adapters. And I, I forgot to ask Brittany. Brittany, did in building your out your place with all this audio over IP, um, did are you using these kind of adapters to go from like XLRs to so many to of them, so so <laughs> many of them. <laughs> and and I guess you probably bought them a few months ago, right? Yes, um, we we have the Studio Hub adapters in every style. Um, we even had them make some custom adapters, uh, and oh. and we also have uh, the headphone the headphone uh, modules that they that yeah, they oh, manufactured. So I've yeah actually, and you can still get that even though uh, Radio Systems is no longer the same thing as Studio Hub. Uh, Angry Audio is offering. There you go. There's a radio systems, uh, I mean, say studio hub um, headphone amp right there. And uh, with the kit that it comes with, including they even have a, a different front panel label. If you want to mount this thing horizontally, then you get a new label to put over the front so that the, the you don't have to read the words, you know, vertically. And if you want to mount one of these things under the console, and I've got some of these at my radio stations in American Samoa, this is an under the console uh, under the table mounting right here. So you run some screws up here and there you are. This, yeah. This, and this keeps people from their knees hitting the, the sharp edges of this. Right. Yeah. And that just mounts right I will up in there. Say that the, the modules still work. Uh, if they go through the wash, what? Uh, <laughs> no, You're it was one of those long nights. Wash. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't empty my hoodie pockets. <laughs> Oh so. no! Or is it because you were hangry? <laughs> <laughs> just exhausted. Well, I just I, I want to tell you that uh, Studio Hub lives. If you love the adapters, uh, and of course they use Cat Five cable to easily hook uh, analog or AES digital gear with their XLR connectors or uh, quarter inch uh, tip ring sleeve connectors. Uh, any of these these connectors. Uh, get get your adapters. Um, they're they're now made by Angry Audio, still with the Studio Hub name, same factory, same jigs, 
same materials, get them from your favorite dealer, ask for them by name, Studio Hub from Angry Audio. And right now, if you order, you get a free, if, if for every one of these gray things that you order that's got the female connector on it like that, the female RG45, you can get a free seven-foot Cat5 cable. They have about 3,000 of these to give away. So just ask for your free Cat5 cable. There you go. Even comes with the pinout listed right there in case you forget it. I can't tell you how many times I have Googled Studio Hub pinout to make sure I've got the I got the right wire colors. So thanks a lot, Angry Audio. Angryaudio.com is the place to go to to uh, find out you know the model numbers and all that and get them from your favorite, favorite dealer. Okay. Uh, we've come to the end of our show. And Brittany, I, I, as usual, I totally forgot to tell our guest or ask our guest about a tip of the week. And if you'd like to pass along oh something that you've learned, you know, a website you use, a tool that you use, a technique that you use to get people to do their jobs or something that you've done, figured out to that saved you some time and energy and, and money. Great. But you've got, you've got a few seconds before we get to you. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to call on Chris because he's always, always prepared with a tip of the week, Chris. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, the tip of the week, since we're talking about new construction and remodeling and changing out studios and doing great things, it's uh, that time of year again. I randomly say that, but it's any time of year, really. Imaging your drives. Okay. I uh, recently did some work on a couple of our drive uh, laptops we use for fundraising, and um, mm -hmm. a couple of them are pretty much long in the tooth. But I had some images of drives that I on the shelf from earlier uh, in the year, took off the shelf, placed in the laptop. And five minutes later, they're back in operation, and the drives on the table could be repurposed for you know low low priority stuff. So, um, go through your transmitter site, check equipment that might have a hard drive in it, solid state or you know spinning disk, image it. You never know when you're going to need it because about a month ago, I'm doing some volunteer work with a nonprofit, and I maintained two of their servers and got a phone call. We think we have a problem. We're not sure, but can you check it out on your next visit to the site? I'm like, sure. Mm -hmm. And you know what it was? That screeching sound you get from a spinning disc that starts to lose its, uh, you know, smooth spin. Well, yeah. Good thing we had we had when we installed the server almost two years ago. We did several images, and I took it off the shelf, plugged it into the server, and we continued operating. So I'm just saying. I know it sounds crazy. It may sound too simple. Oh yeah, it's that's you know, what's the big deal? It is a big deal because if you have a piece of equipment that relies on a hard drive. And it goes, and you rely on it. You're uh, you're up. You're in a creek that's not very clear. Good advice. <laughs> and no, oh, I had a I, I had an, an SSD uh, drive problem with my MacBook laptop. Turned out the SSD tested okay, but it it wouldn't boot. And I I took it to Apple, see what they wanted to do about it, and they said just we're just going to wipe it. It tests good. Sorry, it tests good. So uh, we wiped it and rebuilt it. And uh, you know what? I hadn't had a backup in six months, and I'm so upset about that. So, oh, well. I, I got everything rebuilt. And, and the same day, I went and bought a, a new backup drive, which is hooked up to my Mac right now. So backups, yeah. You don't think about them until you need them, and then you need them. And one thing's for sure, every hard drive is going to fail. It's absolutely positively going to fail, and you don't know when. That's maybe true. it'll That's scream. True. Maybe it, Maybe it'll scream beforehand, and maybe it won't. <laughs> SSDs don't usually scream. No, they Brittany, just stop. Br Brittany, I'm sorry to put you on the, on the spot. And if your answer is, I gave you all my tips already. <laughs> Go back and watch the show again. <laughs> Got a tip um, for us, we, one, one cool thing that uh, we came up with is uh, the campus switched to all VoIP phones. Um, it's probably oh. happened many, many places. Well, when they took away the analog lines, we lost our silent sensors. Um and we didn't really have a solution for that. When Pathfinder got installed, we set up some alarms in Pathfinder. You can uh, make it send an email and text, but emails and text will not wake the engineers up in the middle of the night. We need a phone call. So we found right. a cool little service. There's a bunch of them online, but we went with one called Ops Genie. And, um, and you can route all kinds of alerts, data, text, emails into Ops Genie and, it, and set escalation priorities and it will call you. Um, and it's pretty awesome. We've been using it for about a month now. Uh, so we have silence alarms back. Um, and, and we also now have a, for the first time ever, a rotation of who's on call schedule instead of everyone on call all the time. Uh, so 
the the team's loving that and um and yeah, it's it's been kind of fun to use. So Ops Genie was our solution to not having an analog silent sensor anymore. It looks like Ops Genie is one of the many services offered by Atlassian. Is that the right? We that's love Atlassian. Yeah, <laughs> we use yeah. many, many Atlassian products. Um, we uh, use Confluence for our documentation. Mm -hmm. We use Jira for our trouble ticket system. Um, we're it's not really up and running yet, but we're working on status page. Um, that that just to let people know when we take things down on purpose for maintenance when something actually breaks once it when it's coming back um you know yeah atlassian's been wonderful um to work with and they have so many different kinds of tools out there that's good to hear atlassian sponsors a number of different tech podcasts across the the, the industry spectrum and uh see that'll be a sponsor right here too so thanks for the good <laughs> word on that I'm, I'm glad it works for radio tech groups as, as well as uh, as you know a, a regular as IT tech group so that's good to know awesome we have been talking to Brittany Williams Brittany thank you so much for being on our show it's been a delight to have you here and thank you for the tour that I got a couple of months back yeah thanks Kirk this was fun and come back anytime you want um you know maybe when the weather is nice again winter passes we'll actually be done <laughs> Yeah, you know, when you're all done, we should get a little video tour or some pictures or something and and, and see the studios. That would be awesome. Sure. At, at Definitely. the very latest, at the next at the next Wisconsin Broadcasters, we'll just come and do the show from from your place. How about that? Oh, well, that'll be fun. <laughs> that would be great. Right. And maybe and and maybe Chris Tobin can make it out there too. That'd be cool too. I've already got it on the calendar. I'm making plans to keep it open, so I'm going to do my best not to let anything get in the way. Good deal. All right. Hey, you've been watching This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the uh, microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. And the day was, was we were talking to Brittany Williams. She's the uh, Director of Operations and Engineering at Wisconsin Public Radio. Chris Tobin's been with us as well from the studios of WBGO. And I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio. Huge thanks going out to our show producer, Suncast. Thanks very much. And also to... Um, uh, Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network, where you'll find lots of cool podcasts like Matt Men and What the Tech and plenty of others. Check them all out. Uh, we got to go. Thanks to our sponsors. Please patronize them, and we'll see you next week. Oh, no, actually, next week is uh, Thanksgiving. Hey, we should have this. We should have a little tech me uh, meeting right now. Chris, uh, if I cancel next week's show, is that okay with you, or would you like to do it by yourself? Hmm, let's see. Do I get in trouble if I do it by myself? Oh, yeah, I would. Yeah, never mind. No, we'll have to do it every okay. week. <laughs> All right, we're going to take it. We're, we'll take next week off and replay an old one. And that means Suncast gets the day off as well. And maybe we can all just have some turkey. How about that? Works for me. All right. We'll see you then in two weeks for the next This Week in Radio Tech. Tell your friends, subscribe to the show, and, um, and hey, share it uh, on your favorite uh, social media. We'll see you in two weeks on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye bye.